Thank you, Larry. We are in a great book, the book of Colossians, a brief book, but one that is just filled with lofty theology and important exhortations. And we come to such a text in our studies this morning. We're looking at Colossians chapter 1, and we're going to finish the chapter beginning with verse 24 through 29. Paul writes, Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I do my share on behalf of his body, which is the church, in filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions. Of this church I was made a minister according to the stewardship from God bestowed on me for your benefit, so that I might fully carry out the preaching of the word of God. That is, the mystery, which has been hidden from the past ages and generations, but has now been manifested to the saints, to whom God willed to make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. We proclaim Him admonishing every man and teaching every man with all wisdom so that we may present every man complete in Christ. For this purpose also I labor, striving according to His power, which mightily works within me. May the Lord bless this reading of His Word and bless our time of studying it together. Let's bow at a word of prayer. Many years ago, I remember my father pointing up to the tall steeple of a large church just south of here and saying, I want to put that on all my son's watches. He was looking at the clock on the steeple that had two words on its face, night cometh, from John chapter 9, verse 4. Night cometh when no man can work. It was the Lord's alarm to his disciples. Time is short. Be active. I never got the words on my watch, but I often think of that when I drive by that clock tower. Paul did more than think. He worked. In fact, no apostle worked like Paul. He spoke of that to the Corinthians. In 1 Corinthians 15, he called himself the least of the apostles, but said, I labored more than all of them. Yet not I, but the grace of God with me. He gives a brief account of his ministry in our passage, Colossians chapter 1, verses 24 through 29. It's just six verses, but it has the words sufferings, labor, and striving. Paul was industrious and sacrificial. He worked for the Colossians, he said, and Gentile believers across the world in the ages so that they would know what he calls the mystery and so that he could bring them to maturity. It was a labor of love and an example of serving God and serving his people But he wrote this not really to encourage us to work, but to encourage us with the lesson, with the truth that he labored so hard to give. It was so important that he gladly suffered to give it. It's about the mystery, as I said. It's about the riches and the glory that are in Christ. His his ministry was glory-bound. He was on the road to glory, and that too is incentive to work and to labor. But it was a rough road. He began speaking of the hardships he suffered in order to reveal this mystery to the Gentiles. He suffered physically in his flesh, he said. Still, he rejoiced in it. Now, how is that? The way he explained his joy in suffering is by the blessing he brought to the church through all that he suffered, through all of his labors, all of his difficulties. That made it worth it 
though he suffered much. Doesn't recount it here, but he did in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. And there he gave a long list of hardships he experienced in his effort to bring the gospel to the Gentiles, to bring this mystery to the Gentiles. He was always on the road, on frequent journeys, he said. He didn't have a home, he didn't have a lake house. He was always traveling, crossing rivers and seas and continents. And along the way, he was attacked by bandits, highwaymen, his own countrymen in the synagogue, and by Gentiles. He was stoned and beaten and flogged numerous times. He was shipwrecked three times and once adrift on the sea for a night and a day, clinging to some piece of wreckage. In labor and hardship, he said, through many sleepless nights, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure, all physical hardships. And equally, if not worse, he suffered spiritual hardships. Daily he felt, felt pressure from the churches as he worried about their spiritual needs and the dangers that they faced. Have you ever worried about your children? Your parents you have. Well, Paul's children were the churches, the saints. And he was continually weighed down with concern for them. <clears throat> In one of his sermons, J.H. Jowett said, I once saw the track of a bleeding hare across the snow. That was Paul's track across Europe. That's a picture. A great apostle limping and bleeding across continents to give hope to the lost in his generation and generations to come. So here as he sat in a Roman jail with a chain on his wrist, he wrote, I rejoice in my sufferings. It wasn't the sufferings, of course, that gave him joy, but the reason for the sufferings, making known the mystery to them. It was for their sake, he said. That drove him on, his love for God's people and his love for the Lord. I do my share on behalf of the body, which is the church, he said. The gospel is spread so often through hardship. But there's no greater cause in all of the world than the cause of Christ and the church. So Paul rejoiced through it all. But in saying that, he also said his suffering was his share in filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions. Now on the face of it, that, that's a puzzling statement, especially in this book, this book of Colossians, which is all about the sufficiency of Christ and the sufficiency of his sacrifice, his sufferings. Paul has just said that... <clears throat> Through the Lord's sacrifice, God has rescued us from the domain of darkness. He has redeemed us and gained for us forgiveness, and He's reconciled us to God. Christ has done it all. There's nothing left to add to Christ's sacrifice. He made that very clear on the cross when He said, It is finished. It's finished. Nothing more to be done. He's done it all. What then could Paul mean that by his sufferings, he was filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions. Certainly, he didn't mean he added anything to the efficacy of the cross. He didn't add anything to the power of, of the cross to save. We, we have peace through the blood of the cross, he said. He said that in verse 20. Paul's not so quickly contradicting himself. So how are Paul's sufferings Christ's afflictions? How are our sufferings Christ's afflictions? And how is Paul filling them up? I think we get an indication of the meaning of that from Acts 9 and Paul's conversion on the Damascus Road when Jesus stopped him and said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Now you've probably thought about that statement that the Lord made and, and puzzled a bit over it. Jesus was gone, resurrected, and ascended and sitting at the right hand of the Father in heaven, how was Paul persecuting Christ? 
by persecuting his people who are his body. That's how Paul frequently refers to the church as the body of Christ. It's how he describes the church here. In verse 18, he described Christ as the head of the body. So as a head feels pain in the body, so Christ knows affliction in the church. Suffering in a physical body is suffering in its head. When one part of the body hurts, the whole body hurts. A persecuted church, a persecuted Christian, is a persecuted Savior. What this statement teaches is certainly that we are not alone. There is a close connection between our sorrows and joys and Christ. He identifies with us in our trials. If they persecuted me, the Lord told his disciples, they will persecute you. Now, why is that? Because we are his representatives on earth. We are his body. When the world sees us, it sees Christ. And when it persecutes us, it's really persecuting Christ. The afflictions Paul experienced are the afflictions of Christ. The, 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 the afflictions that he would have suffered if he were on earth. Since he is not, they are lacking. And so Paul suffered them in his place and for him. Now some have suggested that filling up could mean there is an amount of suffering the church will have before all is finished and the Lord returns. And Paul was filling up or contributing to that, that uh, Faithful, that, that full service through his faithful service. And maybe that's the case. What, what this certainly does show, though, is that Christ is with us. We suffer his afflictions in his service. The personal sufferings of Jesus are over, but his sufferings in his people still continue. He lives in us. When we suffer hunger, or a beating, or imprisonment, or humiliation, or abandonment, or loneliness. He's there, and He is aware, and He knows our pain and our shame. That's illustrated in the life of the late Dr. Helen Rosevere. I saw an interview with her a few years ago. Um, she was a British missionary who served for over 20 years in the Congo. She had a significant ministry. She was the only doctor in an area populated by more than half a million people. There's a revolution in 1964. She and her workers were captured and subjected to brutal and degrading torture for almost six months. She was personally violently attacked. She watched a 17-year-old student who was beaten and left for dead when he tried to defend her. It all put her in a state of despair. She didn't doubt God's existence, but she wondered if he had forsaken her. It was at that time, while she was back in England recovering from all of this, that the words came to her, not audibly, but, but convincingly, 20 years ago, you asked me for the privilege of being a missionary, the privilege of being identified with me. These are not your sufferings. These are my sufferings. As she thought of that, she was overcome with a sense of, of great privilege. She had suffered in the place of Christ. She had suffered in the place of the Savior. It wasn't easy. She, she had to recover physically. She had to recover emotionally and spiritually. But she was able to do that and she was able to rejoice and say that the Lord is able to use many things to work out His wonderful purpose. That's her expression. And many people came to know the Lord through those long, difficult days of suffering. That's Paul's response. It was his prayer in Philippians chapter 3, verse 10, a verse that oftentimes I've seen people cite as sort of their life verse or they're sign their Bible, sign a Bible and put that 
verse, great verse, Philippians 3.10, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. That's Paul saying, this is what I chiefly want in all of life. It's not simply to carry the gospel out. It's not as important as all that is. What I really want is to know him. And the power of his resurrection, the power that's in me to know it, to experience it, and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. There is a connection to each of the parts of that verse. The more we know Christ, the more we will be transformed into his image by his power, and then the more we will suffer for being like him. But then the better we will know him. And that made Paul rejoice. He knew Christ's life more deeply through all that he went through, and he knew Christ's desire more clearly, which is to serve his people. Paul was doing that, serving the church. He was made a minister of it or a servant of the church, literally a deacon of the church, which means helper. He calls this his stewardship in verse 25. That means a special service. Paul was like a servant in a large house to whom the master had given a specific and big responsibility. And in God's spiritual house, Paul was over the Gentiles. That was his responsibility. The church has never had a servant like Paul, for his industry and heroism. If he had a sundial, he would have put on it, Erketai Nux, night cometh. He worked. He didn't waste time. He was always on the road, as he told the Corinthians, traveling the world, doing the work God gave him to do, preaching the word of God, he says here. But his service wasn't only one of energy and accomplishment, establishing churches and writing scripture, tasks which were in themselves Herculean. It was also a service of humility. There's no real service, Christ-like service, unless it is humble, selfless service. And that's suggested in the term that Paul chose to describe himself, a minister or deacon. He doesn't mean he had the office of deacon in any particular church, but he uses that word to describe his ministry. Literally, deacon means through dust. Diakonos is deacon. Diakonia is service. Those are really two words. Dia through konia, dust. It's a, a picture of someone getting down in the dirt to serve others through the dust. That was Paul, a humble, selfless servant of God and of the church and of the Gentiles, especially pagan people. He went to them with the good news. And for them, he sacrificed. He went across the empire preaching, he says, the word of God. He preached the whole counsel of God. He reminded the uh, elders of the church of Ephesus of that in Acts chapter 20, verse 27. It was the last time they would see each other. It was their last meeting there at Miletus. And he gave them a rundown of his life and ministry with them. And in verse 27, he said, I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole purpose of God. Well, that's really the task of the ministry or servant of the church, to preach the whole purpose, the whole counsel of God, all of the truths and doctrines of Scripture. It's a service. That's significant that he says he didn't shrink from doing that. And I think he put that because he knew what challenges a preacher or a teacher faces that we do. And I can sympathize with that. There are things that you don't want to hear. There are things that this world doesn't want to hear but that are clearly taught in the Word of God. It may be a doctrinal issue. 
It may be a moral issue. And so the temptation to the teacher or the preacher is to just sort of lighten that or avoid that. Paul said, I didn't do that. I didn't shrink from anything. I gave you all of the truth and the doctrines of the Word of God. That's important. That's the ministry. But Paul has something more specific in mind here. That's, that's the general sweep of his ministry. But he had something specific in mind here, which he states in verse 26. It is the mystery. What is that? Now just the word piques our curiosity. Is it something mysterious? No, it's not that. It, it refers to truth previously concealed and now revealed. Paul even states that here in verse 26, that it has been hidden from the past ages and generations, but has now been manifested to his saints. Paul indicated what it is uh, in verse 24, where he spoke of the close connection between our sufferings and Christ's afflictions. The mystery is specifically for us, specifically for saints. Verse 27, to whom God willed to make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you. The hope of glory. Well, that's it. The mystery is Christ in you. It's not Christ. It's not salvation for the Gentiles. That was all prophesied from the very beginning. Genesis 3.15, we have the promise of the Messiah, the promise of a deliverer to come, the promise of Christ. In chapter 12, verse 3, there's the promise that Gentiles would be included in the blessings of Abraham. And we have that all through the prophets. The mystery is not the church. A mystery, again, is a truth never before revealed. And Christ spoke of the church. He spoke of it in Matthew 16, verse 18, when He said, I will build my church. As well as in Matthew 18, verse 17, when He spoke of the discipline that must come when a person, a believer, is sinful and it must be made known to the church, He said, if that person is unrepentant. The mystery is that Christ is in believing Gentiles in the same way, to the same degree, that He is in believing Jews. The two are one people. Gentile and Jewish believers are equal in Christ and equal in the blessings of salvation. Gentiles, He's saying, are not second-class citizens. You're equal with your Jewish brothers and sisters. That's how Paul explained the mystery in Ephesians chapter 3, verses 4 through 6, that the Gentiles are fellow members of the body, fellow members, equal members of the body, and fellow partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel, equal heirs with them. Now that was an amazing thing, because he's saying, you who are considered dogs by the Jews are now equals with, equal with them in God's saving plan and purpose. Here the emphasis is that Christ is in all of us, every believer. He dwells in us through the Holy Spirit so that the two ideas seem to kind of blend. Christ in us, the Holy Spirit in us, they seem almost identical, but the emphasis here is on Christ because that's the emphasis of this book of Colossians. He is all sufficient for every need we have. And since we have his life in us, which to go back to that statement that Paul made in Philippians 3.10 is resurrection life. There's no more powerful life than that. The greatest power there is, power of Life over death is in us, resurrection life. Since we have that in us, every one of us as a believer in Jesus Christ, what he's saying is we're well equipped for every challenge that we may face in life. He is with us. And that is riches, Paul says. We are rich with power and knowledge that the world does not have or know. It can't know this. This blessing is to his saints. 
not to the world. Our riches are different from what the world works for. We haven't been promised prosperity. We haven't been promised riches. That's what the world seeks. And sometimes we certainly do as well. But that's not what we've been promised. Paul, in fact, told the young churches on his first missionary journey, the young churches in Asia in Acts chapter 14 and verse 22, through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. That's the reality. That's life for the church in this world at this present time. Through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. Our riches enable us to do that, to suffer for the faith and labor for the Lord and labor for others and experience material loss and rejoice as Helen Rosevere did and, and as, as countless others have done, countless Christians down through the ages. Now, that's alien to the world. That's something the world can't figure out. What the world can know, though, is what it sees in us as we go through tribulations, and hopefully, by God's grace, it sees Christ in us. It sees something different in us from all of the world around it. Well, it will see that, but only by God's grace. The Christian life is a life of grace. And so we can expect that. I said it before, I say it, I'll say it again because it's clearly stated in this passage. The Christian life is a supernatural life. We don't live life in our own strength. Well, when we do that, we don't live well. When we live well, when we live properly, we live life in His strength. And because we do, we can be obedient because He gives what He commands. That's Remember Augustine's prayer. Command what you will, but give what you command. And he does that. And we're to trust him. He's faithful. Never calls us out on any mission, on any road, and certainly not this road to glory. He doesn't call us out without giving what he requires of us. And that was Paul's experience. He had a painful problem, you know, a, a crippling illness. He doesn't explain it, but he does call it a name. He gives it a description in the sense of a thorn in the flesh. We don't know what that thorn in the flesh was. He also says it was a messenger of Satan sent to torment him. That's how Paul describes it. He, pr he prayed repeatedly that God would remove it. God didn't. Sometimes he doesn't take those things away, but he doesn't for a reason. And really, he does answer Paul's prayer because finally he spoke to Paul and in speaking to Paul, spoke to us, all of us. He said, my grace is sufficient for you. And it, it was. And it is for us. We're not alone. The Lord is with us always. Our trials are his trials. Our suffering is his afflictions. He endures them with us and He sustains us in them. And He gives us hope. This mystery of Christ in you is, Paul said, the hope of glory. And there too are riches. Riches yet to be known. Riches yet to be experienced. Hope is future. And it is necessary for continuing on in the Christian life. No one can live well. No one can live earnestly, bravely, without hope. But Paul says we have hope. We have hope of glory. That's our future. And it's certain. When Paul speaks of hope, he's not speaking of a wish, of, of something we, we might take place. We hope it does. We don't know for certain. No, this is a certainty. It's just a future reality that we will, are yet to experience. Hope for us is a certainty. What that means is the hardships of life will end. And what will replace them is blessing. Paul calls it glory. It's inexpressible because it's incomprehensible. 
doesn't go into the details of it, but that's our hope, glory that is beyond our comprehension. But, but then again, that indicates his greatness. If he could explain it fully, it'd be limited. This is unlimited glory that is beyond our comprehension. And this too is incentive to be faithful and minister, to serve God and to serve one another because glory is coming or, or we're coming to glory. We're on that road to glory. It is certain. And whatever we suffer or whatever we lose in this life, this brief, brief life, whatever we lose in this life will be more than made up for us, rewarded by the Lord. Paul spoke of that in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, and verse 17 and 18. For momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. He's not saying the, the light afflictions are doing this. What he's saying is every affliction that you suffer in this life for the Lord is light compared to what you're going to receive in its place. While we look not at things which are seen, but at things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. That's what we're going to have, the eternal things. You cannot sacrifice any good thing or suffer any hard thing that God won't more than make up for it in the world to come. But of course, that requires faith in the promise. Uh, faith is looking at those things that are not seen and are eternal. We trust God's word for them. We believe him. That's the life that we're called to live. It's a life of faith, not a life of sight. We trust in God's word. And in trusting in his word, we believe that he is good for his word. That he keeps his promises. Well, the guarantee that he is good for his word, the guarantee that he keeps his promises, at least one guarantee is that we will possess this glory to come, is Christ. His spiritual life in us now is the assurance that the same life, that spiritual life in us, will become our physical life in the resurrection to come, physical and spiritual together in a glorified state, a glorified body. That hope and Paul's love for the saints and his desire to see them grow to maturity, to God's glory, motivated Paul in his ministry. So he says in verse 28, we proclaim him admonishing every man and teaching every man with all wisdom so that we may present every man complete in Christ. That's, that's the ministry. That's the complete ministry. That's what we are to be doing here, is seeking to make us, every man, man and woman, complete, mature. It's not just, it's not just about being born it's about growing up. It's not just about the gospel and coming to faith. That's just the beginning. There's a maturing process that goes on. And Paul is speaking of that. Helping the saved to work out their salvation so that they become mature saints. That's the goal of the ministry. That's the goal here. That's why we teach the Word of God because this is what will cause us to mature and grow. And that happens through the message, the faithful preaching of the message. And that's what Paul spoke of. He talked to the Corinthians about his ministry. He said that we preach Christ crucified. If Christ is not the center of the message, if the cross is not the center of it all, if the gospel of a crucified Savior whose work of atonement saves the sinner through faith and grace, if that's not preached, then there's no ministry. The ministry here is, as Paul told the Corinthians, Christ crucified. Christ, very God of very God and very man of very man. The God-man who died to save sinners. Now that's the heart of it. But that's not all there is to know. Uh, it's really just the beginning. In chapter 2 of Colossians, in verse 3, 
Paul says that in him, that is in Christ, are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And, and this is for all of us, again, every man, man and woman, but, but everyone, everyone in the church, it's for us, these hidden treasures of wisdom and knowledge, and this, this project, this ministry of bringing us to maturity. It's not for some elite group of intellectuals, as these, these heretics who had come to Colossae were, were saying. It's for all of us, all in Christ. We have been given a, 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 a fortune now, Paul is saying. And we're to go get it. We're to mine it. We're to dig for it. Mining the treasure is the activity of a lifetime. There is no end to it. We, we cannot study God's Word and come to the end of it. Read through your Bible a few times and, well, I've done that. I've, I've finished all of that. We cannot study the Word of God enough. There's no end to the study of it, to plumbing the depths of it. We cannot study Christ enough. And if we study Christ, we study the Godhead. We study the Trinity. And if we study the Trinity, if we study God, we, we study His work. We study His creation. We know ourselves by knowing Him. John Calvin began the Institutes of the Christian Religion, his... I guess we call it his magnum opus, with the statement, this is the first sentence, nearly all the wisdom we possess, that is to say, true and sound wisdom, consists of two parts, the knowledge of God and of ourselves. We will never know ourselves, we will never understand people, we'll never understand human nature, we'll never, never understand this world if we don't know our Creator and Redeemer. There's no more in, important study than that. There are many important studies in this world, not to take away from any of that, but this is the most important study for a person's life. Study of God. It's, it's the study of ourselves. We learn about ourselves by learning about Him. But again, it's, a, it's the task of a lifetime. We are thirsty souls who have been given living water to drink. But it's an ocean of living water. Who can drink up the Atlantic and Pacific of God's truth? It's like a, a feast of gourmet food set on an endless table. And we will never reach the end of it. We will never be full. We will never be satisfied. Well, it will satisfy us, but satisfy us in such a way that we want more. Each bite makes us hungry for more. It's true. The whole counsel of God is that good. Now, if you doubt that, and I suspect some of us are doubting that. Well, I know it's important to know the Word of God, but like a great banquet? Like, like a, a feast? Yeah. If you don't believe me, put it to the test. That's what David said in Psalm 34. He said, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Try it. Ask Him to give you an appetite for His Word, for doctrine, for the knowledge of Scripture. And He will do that. That's a prayer that He will answer. Paul's ministry was to teach it. That is essential for any real ministry, teaching God's Word and applying it, exhorting us to move on in the faith and also confronting failure when it's necessary. Paul did all of that. He was concerned about God's people. He sacrificed his time for them. That's the ministry. It's not easy. It's hard. But it's necessary if saints are to grow and become mature, if they're to become complete in Christ, which is the goal of the ministry. He speaks of the difficulty of it in the last verse. Verse 29. For this purpose also I labor, striving according to His power, which mightily works within me. He labored. He struggled. That's the idea of striving. It has the sense of, uh, of agonizing in a, a foot race or 
in a wrestling contest, but Paul kept at it, kept at it to the very end. Now again, I don't think Paul's purpose here was to encourage us to work, but to encourage us with the reason that he labored so hard. It was to give the mystery and, and help the saints become mature. But when we understand the mystery that Christ is in us, that He is therefore with us in the most difficult of times and circumstances, and that He has, as the commentator John Eady called, sympathetic sorrows, that's incentive to work and to serve. The main thought, I think, of Paul's statements here in this passage. Can we put this way? Paul's joy at bringing the mystery to the Gentiles through great labor and even suffering shows the greatness of the mystery, the value of it. And that mystery, if we take it in, if we understand it, makes us desire to labor earnestly. After all, it's the road to glory. And we're not alone on that road. He's with us, leading us, and more. The Savior who commands, give what, gives what He commands. Paul said, I labor, striving according to His power, which mightily works within me. It's a supernatural life. He worked hard. Paul knew that night was coming when he could no longer work. But he did so ultimately by the power of God, by the life of Christ in him, which worked mightily as it does in you, as it does in all of us. That is grace. And when we understand grace, what Christ has done is presently doing, what he will yet do for us, what eternity holds for us, then we will want to labor and strive for him and his people. Christian life requires discipline, it requires saying no to things we may enjoy, living a life uh, that's somewhat strict, giving up foolish things, giving up, well, good things for things that are better, more important. Life is urgent. Life is short. Saints are to be serious. All of that is true. But nothing motivates the Christian more than God's grace, realizing that we were born into this world guilty, alienated, and hostile, and hopeless, just like these, these Colossians and those Ephesians were. But we have been saved, saved out of that, and given hope. We're on glory road, but not for long. Life is short. That road is short. Moses said it, no matter how long you live, and he lived to be 120, no matter, for soon it is gone and we fly away. That will be a great day. We fly to realms of light. We fly, we fly to realms of, of beauty, peace, and joy where suffering and sorrow are forgotten forever. Words fail us when we try to describe what Paul is speaking of here when he says the hope of glory. We don't have the words to explain it. We live by faith, but the fact that we can't explain it, as I said, indicates the greatness of it. Still, while that's our hope and that is where we're headed and that is what we're going to enter into, still, we want to enter having lived well and labored hard. So may God... Give us grace and help us to know that His power works within us so that we might work and even suffer, if that be His will, but do so with joy and gladness. If you're here without Christ, you're not on glory road. You're on a different path and one that leads to destruction forever. Night cometh, and for unbelievers, it is eternal darkness. 
But know this. The sacrifice has been made so that sinners may escape the wrath to come and be saved forever and have a hope that will not disappoint but give eternal life, glory, and joy. And it's in Christ. And it's received through faith and faith alone. If you've not believed in Him, trust in Him. Receive His life and His, His ministry. Receive all that He's done through faith. Trust in Him. May God help you to do that and help all of us. To know we're on that glory road and we have a glorious future before us and we have the power within us to enable us to serve the Lord now the time we have. May God help us to do that. But why don't we conclude with a great hymn of praise, hymn number 49 in the Red Book, O oh, for a Thousand Tongues, and then remain standing for the benediction. Hymn number 49. Father, we certainly have every reason to leap for joy when we consider what you have done for us through the person and work of your Son. We thank you for the gift of life in him. May we serve him well. May we serve our triune God faithfully. By your grace, we will. We thank you for all that we have in him, and it's in his name we pray. Amen.